for coming down, you guys. You having a good Sabbath? Yeah, good. Hey, do you guys remember last week, Pastor Rick had shared something from John 15, 17. And it said, this is my command, love each other. What do you guys do that shows love? Have you done anything to show love? What can you think of? Yeah. Oh, giving your mommy a Valentine's Day gift? Yeah, that's love, giving gifts. Any other ways we show love? By helping our parents. Oh, being helpful to parents, absolutely. Yeah, one more? Um, by, like, yeah, giving hugs. Oh, yeah, we love hugs, right? That makes us feel loved for sure. Well, one way I like to show love is through words of affirmation. Do you guys know what that is? Yes. Yes, is it's saying nice things to people, right, and building them up, telling them what you appreciate about them and good things that you see God doing in their lives. So last week, my class, they made posters for all the other kids in the school, and they got to tell them one thing that they really appreciated or admired about them, and they got to tell them one thing that they prayed God would do something for them. And guess what? I figured, yeah, the kids would probably like that. That'll be just a nice thing to do. But oh my goodness, when the other kids came out of their classrooms and they saw these posters on their lockers, they were so excited. They were just squealing and their faces were lighted up. And you would think that they just got the best gift ever. And that's just from a little poster from someone else telling them something kind that they liked about them. Is that kind of cool? Yeah. Well, you know, and at first, the older kids, I'll have to tell you, they kind of had a hard time coming up with, well, what do I tell them other than at first people were just like, oh, you're cool. Oh, it's fun. Nice hair. Right? And those things, that's nice to say things like that. But when they had to really think about something they really truly appreciated about somebody else, it was a little bit challenging. It was a little bit hard. And I think that's because we just don't practice it. We do not, in our world, we kind of, we even, have you guys ever tried to get your sibling in trouble or tattle on a classmate and try to get them in trouble? And when you do that, that doesn't really make you feel good. It doesn't make them feel good. And it doesn't make your teacher feel good or your parent feel good either, right? But have you guys ever done something to make somebody feel good, done something really nice for somebody else? Yeah, like what? Um, like Giving somebody something, yeah, what else? Oh, yeah, helping somebody when they were hurt. And you know what, when you do something like that, did that make that other person feel good? Yeah, did it make you feel good because you were helping them? Absolutely, and you know who else it made feel good? It made anybody else seeing you do that nice thing, it made them feel good too. So when we build people up, we are sharing God's love with other people, okay? But let's see, hmm, if it was hard to do that, what do we do if we're not very good at something? How do we get better at it? Yeah. Keep on trying. Do what? Keep on trying. Keep trying. Absolutely, that's right. You practice, right? So if God's command is to love each other, and one way we can love each other is by sharing kind things, kind words about each other. And if we can get better at that by practicing, how about if we all practice that today? You guys want to do that? So actually, it's a challenge for everybody out there. You guys get to participate. Yay, you're excited. Okay. (laughs) So we are, you're going to turn to someone near you. We're all going to turn somewhere in here. And there's three things you could do. One is you can just give a handshake, give a smile, and say happy Sabbath. That's an encouragement. That's sharing God's love. Okay, you want to go a little bit deeper? Maybe give them a hug, give them a short blessing. And then the third level is even deeper. If you really, especially if you know that person, try to think of something that you genuinely appreciate about them. Okay? Something you genuinely appreciate or admire about them and share that with them. 
All right, so I'm going to pray, and then we're all going to do this, okay? And don't forget those people. If there is somebody that is on their own, please go and shake their hand and meet them. Somebody once told me, you never know. You might be meeting your new best friend. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you want us to experience your love and your joy every day, Lord. And I thank you that you use us and to share that love with others. Lord, I pray that this time would be meaningful and that um, we wouldn't just do this today right now in church, but we would try to continue to practice this every day in our lives, building each other up, making a difference in this world, God. In your name I pray, amen. If you want to stay where you're at, that's fine too. Um, before I go into what I was going to say, I just found out that Bill and Lita's um, daughter Tammy is in ICU from a heart attack, and she. Oh, Lita's in. I thought you said her daughter Tammy. Okay, so Tam, um, Lita is the one at ICU, and she's not expected to make it. So please be remembering her and their family throughout the day. You know, um, God has really just been talking to me a lot about shelter. Um, I guess he's always talked to me about shelter, even before I really knew him. He shelters us from so much. He shelters us from fear. He shelters us from pain. Sometimes he shelters us from ourselves. This morning, I know a lot of you have read Jesus Calling, but today's devotion just really kind of hit me says, I am with you and for you. You face nothing alone. Nothing. When you feel anxious, know that you are focusing on the visible world and you're leaving me out of the picture. The remedy is simple. Fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Verbalize your trust in me the living one who sees you always. I will get you safely through this day and all your days, but you can find me only in the present. Each day is a precious gift from my Father. How ridiculous to grasp for future gifts when today's is set before you. Receive today's gift gratefully, unwrapping it tenderly and delving into its depths. As you savor this gift, you will find me. And that just really sums it up. You know, God shelters us, and all we have to do is trust in him. And he's already done everything else for us. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, right now I would just lift up Lita, and I would just lift up that whole family to you, Lord. The pain and the loss that they're feeling right now. But Lord, I just pray that through it all that they would not lose hope and that they would just keep their eyes on you and know that they have eternal salvation. Know that Lita has eternal salvation. I know that she believes in you. I've talked to her many times. and She's such a spunky lady. And Lord, I just pray too for each person here, for the unspoken prayers. I know myself this morning, I've had a rough morning, and yet I put on that fake smile. I put on um, that smiling face, and um, you just never know what anybody's going through. But Lord, you do. You know the deepest, darkest places in our hearts. And I pray that you would just scoop out those dark places and just fill it with your light and your love and help us to just be ever closer to you. And, Lord, I just pray for our church family, our church, our school. And, Lord, we are getting so close to the end, and, but you're still right there with us. You've already seen the end, and so we have nothing to fear. Lord, I just would ask right now that you bless the remaining of this service. Be with those that haven't been coming, and just um, I just pray that they would have the encouragement they need from someone, from you from whatever it takes, Lord, to bring them back. And just help us to be the loving people that you have created us to be. We ask all these things in your marvelous name. Amen.
Hello again. We still doing good? We okay? Cool, cool. Well, hey, this morning we are going to be in the book of Judges. So if you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to to open them with me to the book of Judges, chapter 13. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, no worries. We will have it up on the screen for you. Judges chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 1. The text says that, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. Now there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite, to God from the womb, and he shall begin, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. This morning I'd like to, like for us to look at the story of Samson, because I believe in some way that Samson's story is our story. In some way that Samson's story is your story and is my story. And this morning we will mainly be looking at these first five verses in chapter 13, but we'll also look at the kind of general overview of Samson's life. And as we do that, I believe that we will see that there is a difference between had and still has. There's a difference between had and still has. I'll explain as we go on, but I'd like to just have a quick word of prayer. Would you join me? Lord Jesus, um, thank you for this time and uh, this place to come together and worship you, Father. Thank you for this people, Lord, um, and for your scripture and for what you did in Samson's life and what you're going to do in our lives. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, as a kid growing up, I loved basketball. Yeah, there we go. Still love basketball all the day, just not as much when I was younger. I was a little more passionate about it, all right? Uh, and, and, and growing up, I, I rooted for a couple of teams. But one of the teams I always cheered for was the local Portland Trailblazers. Yeah. Got some fans in here, it sounds like. Uh, if, you're, if you're a real fan of Portland, you, you realize there's really nothing to cheer about a lot of times, though. Sadly. <laughs> Sadly. Now, oh, I was thinking if I should say that or not. But anyways, as a kid, I, I, I would root for the Blazers. And all I wanted them to do was win. That's it. But all they could seem to do was lose. Uh, Some season, they they would sneak into the playoffs somehow, but they'd always lose in the first round, it seemed like. They were in a drought, a losing drought. But that all changed in 2007. Because in 2007, the Portland Trailblazers got the number one pick in the NBA draft, which meant that they got first dibs on the best college players coming into the league. And who did Portland choose? Greg Oden, seven foot tall, 273 pounds. I mean, look at at that basketball. That is a normal basketball in his hands. It's like a softball. You're not going to want to play this guy one-on-one. He's huge. He could score. He could play defense. He was amazing. Uh, ESPN talked about uh, Greg Oden saying that uh, this was a team that you could build a a player that you could build a franchise around. When he came to a team, he was going to bring championships with him. Greg Oden had potential. But what happened to him? Well, 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 Portland picked him up in June of 2007. A couple months later, in September, he had knee surgery, and he was out the entire first season. He didn't play one game for Portland. And sadly, uh, he had more injuries and more injuries, and he hardly played for Portland at all. He did not live up to his potential. He uh, sadly left Portland. They didn't want him, and he's no longer actually in the NBA today. 
Greg Oden was someone who had a lot of potential, but in the basketball world, he failed miserably. And, and the truth is that Greg Oden is a great example of Samson. Uh, which may come to a surprise to many of us because we, we grew up reading these stories about how strong Samson was and how amazing he was, which, which is true. But, but the other truth is that Samson, although he had potential, he had many failures. First, we're going to look at his potential. Now, the text says in, in, in chapter 13, verse 1, that the Israelites were in the hand of the Philistines for how many years? Forty. Forty years. For forty years. The Philistines would come and take what they wanted from Israel. For 40 years, Israel was oppressed. They were in a drought like the Blazers. But then, all of a sudden, there's this story about this baby that's going to be born. And he's going to come and be the next judge and deliver his people. This is Samson's first potential. He was a judge. Now, Now, when we think of Samson as a judge, we should not picture him sitting in a courtroom in a nice suit and tie, listening to cases, saying, you're guilty, you're not guilty. Okay, that's the wrong idea here. Back then, a judge, their job, their purpose was to raise up an army of Israelites and to go and to fight the oppressors, the Philistines, and to deliver Israel, all right? They didn't come out of Egypt from slavery to come and be oppressed, all right? God's raising up judges to deliver his people. That's Samson's first potential. Secondly, the text says that Samson was to be a Nazarite. Now, in order for us to understand what a Nazarite was, we first need to do a little bit of reading, if that's all right with you. Does that sound okay? All right, and don't worry. It's from the most exciting book in our Bible, the book of Numbers. Chapter 6. Man, I tell you what. If you're ever having trouble sleeping at night, got stuff on your mind, just open up Scripture to Numbers, and man, it'll put you out, man. No, Numbers is a great book. It's a great book. Numbers chapter 6. I'm just going to read this to you. You can follow along if you'd like. I'm going to kind of go quickly through the first eight verses here. This is what, this is what a Nazarite was says this, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself or herself to the Lord, he shall, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and he shall not drink any juice or grapes or even eat grapes, fresh or dried, no raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All right, so as a Nazarite, Samson could have uh, no wine, and he could have nothing from the vineyard. I mean, which would be a bummer. I'm sure they had like birthday parties. Kids were probably eating grapes, and Samson's just sitting there like, what am I supposed to do? All right. Next, the text says, All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head. He shall let the locks of his hair grow long. As a Nazarite, Samson could have no haircuts. And lastly, all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. Not even if it's his father or his mother, his brother or his sister. As a Nazarite, Samson could have no interaction with a dead body. This was Samson's potential as a Nazarite. Now here's the point I want us to see. That as we read through the story of Samson, Judges chapter 13 through 16, Samson fails miserably at his potential. As a judge, firstly, firstly, Uh, He never raises an army once to go and fight the Philistines. Matter of fact, the only Philistines that he does kill is out of selfish motives, that he fights is out of selfish motives. As a Nazarite, he failed miserably as a Nazarite. The text says in verse 14, 5, that that Samson went into a vineyard. It says that Samson went down into Timnah and came into the vineyards. Now, we're not really sure what happened here in the vineyards, but some scholars suggest that 
as the story goes, that Samson probably broke that vow and had some grapes, although it's not exactly sure. Verse 14, 5 through 9, Samson kills a lion. Later, he comes back and he eats honey out of its dead corpse, comes into contact with a dead corpse, breaks that vow. Judges 16, verse 19, the famous one, Samson gets a haircut. He didn't do it, but he still broke it. The list goes on and on. Not only that, but Samson, he married who? Philistine. The Torah taught that that you were not to marry any foreigners. Samson broke that as well. And at the end of his life, with his eyes gouged out and his hair cut and his arms are just tied to pillars, he cries out to God after all of those mistakes and he says, God, please still use me. And God still had potential for Samson. God still used Samson. You see, there's a difference between had and still has. All those sports commentators saw how big Greg Oden was, how he could score, how he could play defense, and they said, man, this guy has potential. But after all those injuries, no one still had potential for Greg Oden. All right, there's a difference between someone who had potential in you versus someone who still has potential in you. People who had potential in you, they only saw your good attributes. They only saw your gifts and your blessings. And when they saw you doing those things, they said, man, that guy, that girl has potential. Someone who still has potential in you, though, they they not only see the things you're good at, but they see your failures, your mistakes. They see you on the days when you don't have your makeup on, and they say, man, I still have potential for you. This morning, I believe that just as God still had potential for Samson, that he still has potential for you. Now, I've been married for six months. Six months, yeah. In marriage, thank you, thank you. Give it a clap. Marriage is amazing. I love my wife. She's the best. And here it comes, and here it was coming. But, (laughs) I'm getting the stink eye. No. But, we've been married for six months, but we have had some arguments in only six months. <laughs> Say it's not so. The roll of the toilet paper, <laughs> the toilet paper does not go upside down, it goes right side up. Right? Yes. Six months. Some of us in here, some of you, you've been, you've been married for for 5, 15, 40, 50 years? We got 50 years? Wow, awesome. Pat, Stanley, you guys are awesome. Uh, Phil, Phil. Some of us have been married for a long time. Not just marriage, but relationship. We've had friends for a long time, and there's been arguments, and there's been problems. Some of you may have come to church with your friend or, or spouse, and you may have had an argument on the way here. And looking back, you, you might think, yeah, God had potential for us then. But I mean, now? <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> nice. She's always right. That's a good word of advice. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> No, this is great. This is great. This is awesome. This is great. On a a note, though, but if right now, if you're going through something in your marriage, if you're going through something with one of your best friends, I want to let you know that God still has potential for your relationships. He does. No matter what problems there's been, he still has potential. Great things planned. Some of us in here, we've, we've recently experienced a closed door in our life. Uh, uh, we used to be doing this, right? And this was awesome. And life was good, but now we're doing 
this, whatever this is. And we're not really sure what is in the future. Some of us in here, as we look back on life, we, we think that the best years are behind us. We're in the later stages of life, and as we look forward, we might think, you know, what good, what can I offer to my community? What good can I offer to this world, to this church? If that's you this morning, if you've had a closed door in your life recently, if, if you're in the, the later stages of life, I want to let you know that God still has potential for you. God still has great things planned for you and wants to do great things through you. One more point, then we'll move on here, and that is that I uh, just want us to realize that Samson's vow as a Nazarite, it was a religious vow. And, and he broke basically every single one of those vows. And, and many of us in this room, myself included, we've, we've broken a lot of religious rules, religious laws. And when we do that, uh, on the inside, we might feel a little separated from, from God. Uh, when I make mistakes, uh, I feel like Satan just pounds me and pounds me and makes me feel like, like my relationship with God has suffered, that, that, that maybe something's changed in a way. And I want to let you know, if, if you feel like you've broken a lot of things in, in, in the Bible, any religious rules, I want to let you know God still has potential for your relationship with him. You may, have, you may have had a relationship with God long ago, but maybe you haven't been talking to him recently. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. I want to let you know God has a, still has potential for your relationship with him. There's a difference between had and still has, and it's a good difference. Now, now I've been thinking about this for a while uh, and, and reading this passage, and after thinking about it, I realized that if God still had potential for Samson... And if God still has potential for me and for you, uh, that must mean that God still has potential for, for them. All right, check out what the text says. This gets, uh, this gets pretty crazy. It's awesome. I love it. Here we go. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines, for 40 years. Now, now at first glance, we, we don't really understand the point here that we're trying to get here, that God still has potential for them unless we know the history of the, the previous 12 chapters in Judges. Uh, I would encourage you to go read those sometime. They're good, awesome stories in there. But I'm just going to give you the 30-second recap, if that's okay. Yeah, save some time. Sure, we'll go for it. No response. It's okay. No problem. We'll get there. So during the time of the judges, the society was kind of chaotic, you could say. There was no king, no ruler. The text says that people were doing what was right in their own eyes. And time after time again, this is the structure of the book of Judges. First off, Israel would do evil in the sight of the Lord. Thus, God would give Israel into the hand of their oppressors. Thirdly, Israel would cry out to the Lord for help. And then, once he heard their cry, God would then raise up a judge to deliver the people from their oppressors. You, if you, when you read the book of Judges, this happens time after time again. Israel does evil. God gives them into the hand of their oppressors. Israel cries out, and then God raises up a judge to deliver them. Now, now when, when, with that in mind, let's look at our text again, okay? We'll go through the checklist. Our verse says that the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Check that off. We got that one. What's it say next? So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. God gives them into the hand of their oppressors. What comes next? What comes next is we hear about the birth of a baby. We hear about the birth of Samson, about how God's raising up a judge. Not once in this story does Israel cry out for help. In other words, God still had potential for them, for those people, 
for his people even though they didn't want deliverance. Even though they never cried out for help. Growing up, I've had friends, awesome friends, good friends outside the church. Weren't religious at all. Great people, great friends. Uh, and as life has gone by in, in, in high school and college, they'd come up to me and they'd ask me about God or they'd ask about coming to church. And in those moments, man, I was thinking, man, God is doing something good in their lives. And how foolish was I to think that he just started that. So many times we see broken people and they come to church or they start acting religious and we're like, man, God's doing something great in their lives. And that's true, he is, but he's been doing it a long, long time, their whole life. Scripture talks about that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. Paul writes in Ephesians that while we were still dead in our trespasses, that we were made alive with Christ. What I want us to realize is that the next time we see someone doing something that we don't agree with or that Scripture does not agree with, or if we hear about someone doing those things, instead of seeing them and judging them for their failures, let us instead see them for the potential that Jesus still has for them. Mm. Some of us in here, we're doing stuff that we don't even realize is wrong. And I just, we have a God that's already sent help. He's already trying to help us. What a God is that? What a God we serve. Man, just as Israel was in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years, they didn't ask for help. They were worshiping other gods. Even then, God still had potential for them, even though they didn't ask for help. Firstly, Jesus still has potential for who? For you, for us. Secondly, God still has potential for them. Thirdly, our last takeaway I want us to get from this morning is, is a challenge. And, and I believe it's the same challenge that, that Samson was given. Now the text says that Samson, that Samson would begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. That he shall begin to save Israel. Turn someone next to you and say, begin. Begin. Now, now, I've noticed that, that in a relay race, the same person who begins the race is not the same person who finishes the race. You with me? What, is it four people in a relay race? I didn't look it up. I should have, should have. Yikes. The same person who begins the race is not the same person who finishes the race. As we run through this life, as we run this race, as we run through this life, we are going to come into contact with people who are doing things that, that we do not agree with, that Scripture does not agree with. And when we run into those people, my challenge for us this morning is that we would begin to deliver them. Not by, not by pointing our finger at them and, and judging them, not by throwing uh, uh, Bible verses at them and condemning them with them, but rather by sitting down with them and listening to them, showing them that we care. Take time out of your day to be with them. Take time out of your day to pray for them. Not praying for them thinking uh, they're unrighteous and I'm here praying for them. No, but actually take time out of your day and pray for people. Pray Pray that God would begin something amazing in them. He's already began it, that he would continue. And as we're running through this life, as we're doing all, the, all we can to begin to deliver people, let's remember to pass off the baton to Jesus, who has already finished the race, and who will continue, and will finally one day deliver his people. God still has potential for you. God still has potential for everyone, for them, for all of us. Let us help each other realize that potential.
As we conclude this morning, I'd like to invite the, the band to come back up. Um, I want to share just a really quick story and a reflection on it. Um, throughout my life, ever since I can remember, um, I, I, when I would come into conflict with something, whether it was in sports or school or, or work, my dad would always tell me, he'd always, he'd always look at me and say, Evan, he'd say, he'd say Evan, you're... You're a Davies. He said, you're a Davies. You can do this. That was his motivation. I believe that God says kind of the same thing to each of us. I believe he looks at us and he says, you're my child. You're my child. But God, I've made all of these mistakes in my personal relationships. I've made mistakes in my, in my career. I've made mistakes with you, God. And God says, you're my child. I still have potential for you. And we look at them and we say, God, what about them? Look at what they're doing. I believe God says, they're my children too. I still have potential for them. We're all his children, and when we are his children, that makes all the difference in the world. From the day you were born, you were his child, and he had potential for you then. And all the way, however many years it's been since then to right now, you're still his child, and God still has potential for you. Go and live in that potential today. Amen.